Hey, I'm Fred. And I'm Ant. And this is Create a Generation. Create a Generation of Hype. Frederico, before we get started, we've been working really hard in the background on our own online course called Changer College. The online college just for content creators. Check it out at changercollege.com. That's C-H-A-N-G-E-R college.com. Fred, what's happening this week? This week we are chatting to Shannon Jones from Barnes Patrol. On average, about 10% of all of the viewing traffic on YouTube on any given day is on kids' content. It's bigger than gaming, bigger than beauty. It's huge. It's an epic kids' channel. It is over 8.6 million subscribers, 5 billion views. It is a very big... <laughs> they consider a 20 million view video to be an average to low video. 5 billion views. We lift the lid on kids' content and why it's so big on YouTube. Yep. How kids are watching content on YouTube. Yep. And the issues surrounding kids' content like demonetization and having comments turned off and what that means to create. Yeah, and Shannon talks to us about what it's like to make a video with 800 million views. Epic. All right, let's get into it. Let's get into it. Shannon from Bounce Patrol, welcome to Create a Generation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for joining us. Best place to start is maybe explain who you are and what the hell is Bounce Patrol. <laughs> yeah, I'm, uh, I'm Shannon Jones. I run the channel Bounce Patrol. Um, it is a kids show. We make original music and nursery rhymes and educational songs for kids aged from about one to five. Um, and it is named, the name Bounce Patrol comes from that move that kids do when a song comes on that they really dig, you know, <laughs> and they just start bouncing up and down and they're like, this is my jam. So that's what we aim for. We like to get kids up and bouncing and, and moving around. Is that like tiny, 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 like the like before they actually even know dancing, like a one-year-old Yeah, yeah, before thing. they even know dancing, yeah. like a one-year-old, you see a song come on that they like and they just start, they, yeah, it's yeah, all yeah, in the yeah. knees. They yeah, just start yeah. bouncing up and down. So yeah. that's what we go for. Awesome. Yeah. I had no idea. Um, and you had no idea. You have two kids. How do you have no, no idea? I had no idea it was called, <laughs> like, you know, that's the, the move. It's like they just got their groove on. I've never, I've never. They're like, what are my children doing? <laughs> they're moving very quickly to the music. I wonder what <laughs> yeah, but I didn't, they're thinking. I didn't call it like, oh, they're Bounce Patrol. <laughs> <laughs> now I will. Uh, um, well, I Missy's just Bounce Patrol and just down the hallway. I think, well, they're bouncing. Yeah, they're bouncing. They're bouncing. They're not they're bouncing. And we're just, and they're, yeah, they're <laughs> Shannon and the crew are uh, the patrol. I get yeah. it. I get it. <laughs> Um, I'm glad we've established that. Yeah. That's good. So Bounce Patrol is a, it's a group of five performers. So we have um, five fabulous performers in our in our cast, and we do uh, yeah mainly songs on our on our channel. Awesome. And how long have you been doing this for? Uh, it's about seven years now. We've been doing Bounce Patrol. Okay. I've been doing YouTube a little bit longer than that because I had another channel previously, which was teaching maths, which Ooh. was quite a departure. <laughs> but uh, I did that for uh, sort of two or three years before that. So overall, probably a, yeah, about a decade. I've been doing it. How did that channel go? That channel went well. I mean, I enjoyed doing that. That was um, I. I used to uh, tutor high school maths for a bunch of students when I was, um, you know at university and, and beyond. And I created some videos initially for my students, you know, back in the days when YouTube wasn't really, you know, I wasn't aware of what YouTube creators were or any of that kind of thing. I was making YouTube videos to help my students on the math things that they were working on. And then after a while, more people than just my students were watching those videos. So I went, oh, okay, I could make YouTube videos for other kids who are learning maths and don't have access to a private tutor um, to help them with it. So I was making those videos and started monetizing them and then went, oh, okay, you can you can do all right with this. Is You know, you can make revenue and you can grow a channel and grow a following. Um, but it wasn't really what I was passionate about doing. So then I decided I wanted to have a real serious crack at doing YouTube, but I didn't want to do it doing maths videos necessarily. So um, created Bounce Patrol. That is a Massive difference. <laughs> Huge difference. Mm. Yeah. I mean, but I had a music theatre background. So I came from, um, I ran an amateur theatre company for a decade and had a bunch of friends who were repeatedly in a lot of the shows that I was directing. Um, so doing a lot of, um, yeah, music related things and, and choir projects and that kind of thing with them. So I also had just wrapped that up and I wanted to do a new project with my music theatre buddies and uh, wanted to start a new YouTube channel. And so those thing, two things kind of came together and, and we decided to create Bounce Patrol. Interesting. Actually, Ant has a background in theatre as well. Yeah. And dance, yeah, classic. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't you, Ant? Yes. <laughs> the, theater, yes, but never on stage, always in the background. Um, dance, dance, yes, 
Um, <laughs> Maybe just the bounce version, <laughs> the like, bounce. Yeah. like the toddler bounce. The, the white, the white guy two step, <laughs> um, or drunk guy shuffle. Yeah, the shuffle. Who knows? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> drunk guy shuffle. Really, really, I've got those moves down pat. Yeah. There was an incident with, you know, shout out to everyone who was there. A, a worm incident at, at a New Year's mm. Eve party once that went spectacularly wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, but. Anyway. Does the worm ever go right? I just don't oh, know. you know where I saw the worm going really right in, in a Wiggles video. No, which <laughs> yeah. one of the Wiggles can uh, do the worm? No, no one. None of the Wiggles can. <laughs> they, they don't have the ability. But Dinosaur. they were on stage and they got a guy out specifically to do the worm. He's dressed as a worm doing the worm. Uh, he did it very, very well. Meta. Mm. Hey, have you met the Wiggles before? <laughs> I have not met the Wiggles. No, mm. I think that would be the that would be the peak. Uh, you know, you made it as a children's yeah. performer when you met the Wiggles. Peak right. collaboration right there. Shout out to the Wiggles. <laughs> Shout out to the hey, Wiggles. Yeah, Wiggles. give us a call. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think you've you got a bigger audience than they do on, on YouTube. On YouTube we do, yeah, mm. which is mind-blowing. Speaking of your o- audience, how, how, tell us, how big is your audience? Uh, if you count in subscribers, it's about eight and a half million um, and we're just about to pass five billion views, so... Holy That's moly. quite a lot of views. Yeah, so with kids' content, the subscriber number is sort of... The reverse, you know, when you make content for grown-ups, it's kind of like your views might be 10% of your subscribers. And in kids' content, because kids don't subscribe to things, mm. it's usually the, the other way around. So Yeah, well, t- let's talk about that. Like, l- what's the difference between kids as an audience compared to adults as an audience? Oh, wow. How long have you got? Oh, well, we have an hour. <laughs> how, long, how long have you got? We've got all day. <laughs> um, I mean, kids watch very differently. It depends kids of different ages all have different behaviours as well. So we are quite focused on preschool and sort of up to about school age um, with our audience. But kids as a category, you know, I mean, 11-year-olds watch differently to two-year-olds who watch differently to seven-year-olds. So um, it depends where you're specifying. But if you talk specifically about preschool, I mean, they don't even watch linearly. They don't even watch in order because they jump back and forth around the video. So, you know, one of the things that I always think is really amusing when I'm talking to other kids creators who are just starting out is – they wonder why their audience retention doesn't start at 100%. Mm. Because how can there be an audience retention if you've got, let's say you've got a thousand views on a video and the audience retention starts at 80%. Explain that, Mm. you know, how does that make sense? Mm. Well, it's because kids jump back around and forth in the video and they watch a little bit further on and then they zoom back. And then YouTube, if you come back and watch a video another day, YouTube drops you in where you started, where you left off the Mm. day before or Mm. what have you. So if you watched a little bit of it yesterday and then you came in to rewatch the video today and you started halfway through, then your audience retention starts halfway through the video. So, Mm -hmm. you know, with kids content, it's particularly in preschool, it's not about giving them something new to watch. It's about something that they're going to love. So for example, if you think about, you know, the most popular children's content of recent history, which was the movie Frozen. Um, And if you've got young kids, you know they've just watched that movie a thousand times and they're not watching, you know, 20 different films. They're watching the one film that they love over and over and the same is true for YouTube. Mm. So if they find a video that they really like, they want to watch that video every day. They don't necessarily care about the new video that you've made, which, you know, is an interesting challenge for a YouTube creator because for grown-up content, it's all about fresh stuff. And once someone's watched it once, they're never going to watch it again. Mm. But in preschool content, you're trying to make something that's rewatchable, um, which is a very different kind of approach as well. Mm. Yeah, it's full on. Yeah. Um, it's interesting you like uh, talking about like pre- you know, preschool kids and how they watch YouTube. Mm. Um, just observing like my nieces and nephews with like on, on an iPad, you know, when they were yeah. you know, two, three years old. And those kids would drive, like they were oh, driving yeah, they can YouTube run the iPad. themselves. They yeah, were, and they absolutely. Were, and they were like, I want to watch that. It's like, why? Like they didn't even know what the video was, but they were still yes. clicking on specific things. Like, yeah. Um, is, and is it's all about the thumbnail in kids' so content because so the I mean, viewing session is usually about the suggested traffic um, because they'll be watching something but there's seven other videos that they can see the thumbnail for. And so if they get bored in the one that they're in, they're just going to click. Then They can't search, so they can't come to YouTube looking for something specific. It's all driven by what is getting recommended to them. So becoming a part of the recommendation kind of chain of videos that someone is going to watch is particularly important for preschool kids because they don't – read and they can't search but they can certainly see a thumbnail that they like and click on it and they're not clicking on it because they know what's going to be in the video they just like that picture mm. so thumbnail design is hugely important which is pretty much like adult content we're all just a bunch yeah, of children true. choosing <laughs> choosing the recommended youtube picture using, yeah you know we choose most most 
people, audience, choose. Yeah, but then it's also about the title. So yeah. the reason that in preschool content the titles end up looking like just word soup is because the the only person <laughs> who the title is for is for the algorithm. There Ooh. aren't there aren't kids reading that title and saying that sounds really intriguing, which yeah. is slightly different to the to the adults' content. Definitely. What, what is mainly different about a kid's um, thumbnail image compared to an adult's image to entice a child into yeah. a video compared to an adult? Color is a big thing. I think with adults, it's more about a compelling image, um, and that might just be something that's really intriguing, like you know, a brain or something like that. And then it's a video about you know, the way we think you could just have an image like that that's really kind of sort of draw you in. But for kids it's also about it It needs to um, really be eye-catching with lots of bright colour, lots of saturated colour um, and still be quite simple. So one, our most successful um, thumbnails don't have a whole heap going on. They're enough to convey the message and they're enough to be enticing. But when you put too many people in the thumbnail or you put, you know, text or something like that and there's a lot going on, that doesn't necessarily resonate. Mm, interesting. How do you how do you test all the stuff with kids though? <laughs> I mean, yeah. with adults, it can be pretty, pretty methodical, but with children it can be a little bit, well... Little yeah, it's bit really nuts. tough. Yeah. I mean, I ever since the real-time stats came out f- in analytics, that's been quite helpful as well because I do change the thumbnail um, once a video has been released. And I have a pretty good case study of that from one video that... Um, I put a thumbnail up for that I thought was going to be pretty good and um, changed it, saw that the video wasn't performing as well as I would have expected based on what the video was and um, changed the thumbnail and immediately the real-time views doubled within the next hour and then that that video went on to get recommended in the algorithm and it's now got 250 million views, something like that, which it wouldn't have (laughs) if we hadn't changed the thumbnail. And it was just a really simple, we went from having like a jellyfish a person dressed in a jellyfish costume at the centre of the thumbnail and we changed it to a cow um, and it just was way more recognisable and it was a different it was a different look and um, it's just really simple things. And you, you can kind of work it out sometimes, but if I'd known that the cow would have been more popular, that would have been the first thumbnail I went with out mm. of the gate. So sometimes it's just trying to judge. But I do show thumbnails to the kids in my life and see which pictures they like. Um, and then I also have a Photoshop template where I will put it next to a bunch of other thumbnails. So, you know, it's a it's a screen that ha- that I will put competitor thumbnails up against, and then I'll shrink mine down to the size that it's going to look like on a phone, and then see next to those. Do the colors stand out enough? Is it bright enough? Is it the kind of thing that draws my eye? Um, and I usually have about s- between five and ten thumbnail designs for each video that I'm that I have designed, that I'm narrowing down. Um, so I don't just design one. I usually have a, two or three kind of backups ready to go, but I'll work through a lot of different designs for a video too. Mm. That's that's an awesome tip about having the, the template with the, mm-hmm. the competitors ones yeah. and seeing how that actually looks rather than just yeah, I mean the just shrinking it down to a small size and looking at it is, is beyond a, a, a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. Process, so. but uh, that particularly if all you're competing with – all you're competing on initially is the thumbnail, you really need to know. And, I mean, it's the same with um, content that's designed for grown-ups. If you think about your content and where your content is going to be selected, like picture your home feed and you think about the other videos that you see there, if you saw your thumbnail and title, would you click on yours? Like with everything else that's going on in your home feed, is yours the most compelling one that you would click on? Because if, if the other creators that you love are making titles and thumbnails that are more compelling than yours, then other people are going to be clicking on those too. So um, it's just about making sure that you're really confident that you're going to stand out in that crowd. Very interesting. Well, before we get back into the more te- technical stuff, let's actually just take a, a little step back. Um, in sort of where, did the, where did it all start for you? I mean, like what's your background and how did you end up on YouTube? Yeah, so um, coming from the maths tutoring side, that was um, – sort of fell into YouTube that way, I guess. Um, I did want to create that channel for other students who, um, as I said before, didn't have access to private tutors because I think that can make a big difference in a, in a student's um, education when they can have someone other than their one primary teacher be teaching them something. Um, so I really wanted to do that. And then coming from the music theatre background, um, decided to create a YouTube channel. But 
I also come from a, a business background. I have a master's in business and had done a lot of work with um, small businesses and, and doing sort of strategy marketing, HR consulting um, was my career pre-YouTube. Um, so when I started the channel, I sort of brought a business mindset to it and from the very outset was thinking about, you know, what would be the way to grow this as a, as a channel and as a business. And you never know if you're going to be successful. It was always like, you know, well, this is the dream. So it'd be lovely if we got there, but it'd just be a fun thing to do. Um, regardless, because, you know, I started it with five of my mates. So, um, you know, we, we had a great time and if it didn't go anywhere, we would have had a great time anyway, but I was approaching it. And obviously there was a fair bit of investment early on in songwriting and music production. So, mm. um, there, you know, there was always the hope that we'd be able to turn it into something successful. Mm. Um, yeah. Tell us a bit about the actual, the area of kids content on YouTube as a as a category, like what's it like to work there? How competitive is it? Yeah. Well, there's so many kids watching YouTube. It's a huge category. I mean, it's the third biggest category on YouTube after music and general entertainment, whatever that category <laughs> means. But on average, about 10% of all of the viewing traffic on YouTube on any given day is on kids' content. It's bigger than gaming, bigger than beauty. It's huge. So it is very competitive, but there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of traffic there so if you can get in the recommendation algorithm and get shown to a to a bunch of kids you're going to be able to find an audience if you've got great content mm. um but it is often written about in the media um and it can be somewhat vilified um in some cases rightly in some cases wrongly <laughs> um i think parents are naturally really concerned about anything that that their children are doing um as they should be and um if if something can be a great resource for them, which I think YouTube is, um, then that's great. But then they also worry about, you know, what that means if kids can stumble on the wrong kind of content on YouTube. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, there's good and bad there. And so being a kids creator is one of those things that sometimes we cop a bit of flack for because some people think that um, we're not necessarily doing it um, with the kids' best interests at heart potentially, um, which most of the, you know, kids creators that I know everyone really genuinely loves making kids content and is really passionate about it and always wants what's best for the kids and to be making something nutritious for them but there are some bad actors on the platform and that you know can can sour the the experience a little bit interesting are you talking about like the companies that just churn out content yes so YouTube is getting a lot better at dealing with those bad actors Mm. I mean they kids content was one of the areas that they first started manually working on the algorithm and actually humans went in and pulled some strings to change the recommendation algorithm from the kids content purge 21st of November 2017 which all kids creators remember very explicitly they deleted a whole bunch of channels um, and they uh, pulled monetization from a whole heap of channels and then they um, also got a lot more serious around their policies for kids content so There are actually policies and guidelines for creating um, uh, for creating content for families. So, where grown up content has the community guidelines and the ad friendly guidelines, family content also has a third category, which is the family entertainment guidelines, which most people um, aren't aware aware of. They're sort of buried in a Creator Academy article, but there's a few extra requirements there, and those are mainly around. Um, content that's mass produced, um, content that um, looks like duplicative kind mm. of content, um, stuff that doesn't add any particular value or is mindless, I think is the word that's in the in the community guidelines there. So YouTube really does want the, the content that is being uploaded there to be um, adding value to, to families' lives. What, what's, an, what's an example of, what, what, like not, you don't need to name names, or, but what's an example of a type of mindless content just so people with context yeah um it's a lot of computer generated sort of stuff so you might have a third party ip character like spider-man or someone like that in a 3d generated environment and he's just walking around and kind of looks like a computer game simulation maybe he's just walking around doing things or you might have um uh yeah, there's lots of different examples of just, you know, here's a character and now we're just going to say the name of the character and then we move to the next screen and here's the name of another character and the video mm. just doesn't have anything gotcha. substantive sort of in it yep. and can be made in a, a very quick fashion, very mass produced. 
Um, and there was a lot of that content on YouTube in sort of 2016, 2017. And because kids will click it if it's got a good thumbnail, um, that sort of content was starting to rise in the algorithm, which, you know, the good people who work at YouTube didn't appreciate and neither did parents and families who were watching. So they manually made some changes to make sure that they were quashing that stuff down and then they demonetized it. So they got rid of the incentive to make that stuff. Mm. Yeah, right. So it's it's this the stereotypical mindless put a kid in front of a screen that is genuinely nothing other yeah. than c- yes. coloured bubbles and, and Exactly. And, yeah, and coloured sound. bubbles is it yeah. And so that they they went hard at Yes, they went hard that down. against taking that down. And then they also went hard against um, things that were inappropriate. So we there was an escalation that sort of happened because of um, of the algorithm where s- kids love things that are a little bit like naughty and like mum and dad would be like, ha, 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 you know, you shouldn't watch that. Turn that off, right? Kids will... Kids know when they're watching something that's a little bit inappropriate and then they think that's great. So, <laughs> um, you know, someone made a video where... They had uh, family play characters in them like Spider-Man and Elsa, that kind of thing. Um, and, you know, they do something slightly inappropriate, like they just break a rule and not get in trouble or something like that. And the algorithm would start recommending it because kids would watch that video and like it. So then another creator, um, you know, with not the best intentions, would take that and amplify it a little bit and, you know, take that to the next level. And then another – and that would be successful. And then another creator would take that and amplify that to the next level. And so those incentives were built into the system because those videos were getting recommended in the algorithm for that to kind of spiral out of control and you got to the point where you had family entertainment characters doing very inappropriate things on YouTube and that getting recommended in the algorithm to kids. So that was a really bad problem. So YouTube, that was what the purge of 2017 was about, was about making sure that none of that stuff is going to surface Um, and, and now it doesn't, which is... Fantastic. So they actually solved that problem, which was a really hard problem to solve as a technical challenge. I think you've highlighted like one of, and this is only one area, like one of the many problems or difficulties that it is as YouTube does face as a brand. Yeah. It's getting amongst these things. And when you think of how much content there is on the platform, it is it's an enormous huge. amount of effort to weed out and get rid of yeah. these little aspects. Not and when you're staring down the barrel of a problem of that size, our yeah. recommendation algorithm is recommending things that we as grown-ups would not be choosing for our children to watch. Yeah. But how do we train the algorithm to not select what the kids are going to select? Because mm-hmm. it's the same algorithm that's written for adults watching content on YouTube mm-hmm. and it's designed to know what you're going to like and what you're going to click on. And the difference with kids is we might not want them to watch something that they think they want to watch. But if you're using the same algorithm for those two scenarios, how do you then train it to not necessarily follow the audience? So the algorithm is trained to, to go where the audience wants mm. it to go. Um, and in kids, you don't want it to do that. Um, so that was a really interesting technical challenge and it took some you know manual tweaks around the edges here and there. But I think they've They've come a long way in terms of that. And now in the recommendation algorithm, a lot of what you'll see on kids' content is, you know, just the really fabulous stuff that that genuine creators who love working with kids and, and making great content for kids and enriching families' lives are making. That's the kind of stuff that's starting to get surfaced. So that's late 2017, that big purge. There yeah. was some collateral damage there was, around that. Yeah. It was a tricky time. Um, there, You know, I know a lot of channels who had... I had I know some channels who had their entire um, channel demonetized, so their content still exists there, but they now can no longer make money from the platform. Um, and then other channels who had certain videos demonetized. I mean, we accidentally got one age gated in that process. So we had a video called "Mummy's Got a Baby in Her Belly," which is a very wholesome video <laughs> about you're about to become a big brother or sister and here's what that's going to be like and sometimes the baby will cry and like we mentioned nothing about (laughs) how the baby is going to come into your life just that you will be a big brother or sister um but you know the at during the purge the algorithm grabbed that one and said oh inappropriate only for over the age age of 18 (laughs) (laughs) all these 18 year old kids going (laughs) why am i this is how it works (laughs) um so i can see where the computer system's Maybe, you know, the, the word pregnancy is in the tags mm. and, and things like that. Um, luckily, we were able to get that one addressed. But you're always going to have problems like that when you introduce new changes where sometimes the computers make some mistakes. Um, and so long as you have good system in place for being able to review that stuff and, and you know, get it sent up the chain so that um, you can solve those problems, then 
um, I think it's still worth the collateral damage in order to clean up YouTube as a whole. So even though I was affected by it and I know other people who are affected by it, I still think for kids creators on the whole it has been much better since um, they have been uh, turning their mind to making sure that the recommendation algorithms are only surfacing the, the nutritious stuff. Yeah, awesome. But then now in, in 2019 there's a whole new raft of, of uh, I, I don't know if it's been named yet, but uh, you can – the yes. purge of, of November 2017. I'm not sure what what month it kicked in this year, but there, you know a whole whole raft of changes to to kids channels as well with yep. um, comments being turned off, yes. um, yep. not being able to live stream, things like that. What what's going on there? Um, well, that situation came about un- very unfortunately because there were again terrible people in the world who were um, organising in the comments of YouTube videos featuring children. So that wasn't necessarily content designed specifically for children. That was content that has children in it, mm-hmm. which sometimes is the same thing, but sometimes is not. You know, like you might just have a family vlog, um, which, you know, the people, the audience for that are families, might include the kids, it might just be the parents, um, but children are in the videos. And... Um, there were some videos featuring children's where basically pedophiles were organising in the comments and saying, hey, this is this is a good time code to watch, which is just horrendous mm. and you don't want that to exist on the platform. And, um, you know, YouTube, to their credit, decided that even though turning off comments on thousands and thousands of videos was going to impact creators in a lot of way, that impact is still not worse than yeah. predators <laughs> organising and that, that is a bigger problem. There is no bigger problem than that. So, um, you know, to their credit, they took a hard decision to um, turn off comments. And a lot of people have been affected by that, Um, more so creators who target older channels, uh, older kids than preschool content um, because preschool content, the comments are not as relevant anyway. Um, A lot of our comments are gobbledygook because (laughs) two-year-olds accidentally (laughs) mash the keyboard with their thumbs while they're holding the phone. Um, But if you have comments on, you know, if you're making a gymnastics channel for, you know, 10-year-olds um, and the comments have been turned off, that has a big impact on your community and your audience because those 10-year-old kids love talking to other gymnastics enthusiasts in the comments, for mm-hmm. example. Um, and so that is having a negative impact on those creators. And that's a really hard thing for them to balance. Um, and it's tough for the creators who are experiencing that. But there are ways that they can move those conversations to other platforms and um, so creating those communities elsewhere is at the moment the only workaround for that. Yeah. You also mentioned the other day something about the creator's responsibility for the comments. And yeah. So in those family entertainment um, guidelines and uh, in the YouTube Kids Field Guide, it is mentioned that creators have the ultimate responsibility for the comments that are on their channel. So you you need to be aware of what's going on and moderate ruthlessly. And I think they added that clause in there so that um, YouTube can <laughs> YouTube can say that the comments on a video are not our responsibility, it's the responsibility of that creator. Mm. Uh, but for, the, for that reason, if you've got terrible comments happening on your videos, sometimes it's prudent to turn the comments off um, anyway. Um, so we are really uh, – we make sure to make use of the um, moderation tools that exist, so the blacklist um, – the list of blacklisted words that you can um, have to make sure um, certain words don't get posted on your channel. We have a very long list of words that you cannot post on our channel. Um, And then we moderate every day. Wow. Yeah, which is – and a lot of it is moderating gobbledygook. Gobbledygook. (laughs) F-G-G-E-H-G. Yeah, yeah, Yeah. (laughs) exactly. I'd love to read the comments. Actually, I haven't – I've never actually – even scroll down to look at the comments on, on your channel before. I, I, it never even occurred to me that there was yeah. much happening. Well, there, there isn't so. much happening there. There that on preschool content, there isn't much happening there. There are some, you know, and it's great to see parents saying, you know, um, oh my child was sick, and so we put this on, and you know, they've just been watching it, and make, it's been making them feel better. And you know, you get those comments, and they're so heartwarming, and it's so lovely. So I love that we do still, luckily, have comments turned on on our channel. So. Um, that that's been um, nice for us because we don't have a lot of children appearing in our videos. It's mainly adults appearing in our videos. Um, and those comments are great, but, you know, there's probably 5 to 10% of them are real comments like that and then the rest are, A, people hating on us because it's the internet and then, B, gobbledygook. <laughs> the internet. <laughs> what is wrong with you people? Yeah, it's amazing how, how much hate you get for something that's designed for, for you know, toddlers because... 
<laughs> people well, must have a lot of time on their hands <laughs> if they're coming to it and getting really what, what upset. What kind of like uh, categorically, like what kind of annoying things are there there? Uh, I mean, it's all just the usual stuff. I mean, we have women in the videos, like our cast is three women and two men. So invariably there's always comments about the bodies of the women who are in the videos and all that kind of thing. Um, and, you know, just saying this music is terrible and you guys are terrible <laughs> and all, all of that generalised stuff as well. Yeah. We'll talk about the terrible music soon. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when I'm on the mic. Fred, let's take a quick break here and just give ourselves a big plug. We are super excited by this new initiative. We have created the Changer Creator College. The Creator College, quite simply, is a place where you can get a whole bunch of online courses, including our brand new Accelerate course for YouTube, designed to help emerging and new creators become even better on the world's biggest video platform. The reason we think it's pretty good is that it's not just our opinions, but the opinions of a bunch of really great creators and experts coming together to give you a very logical structured course damn right it is the college just for creators so check it out at changercollege.com that's c-h-a-n-g-e-r college.com there is a lot of talk about taking yes kids content off the main youtube platform and putting it only on youtube, YouTube kids. kids yeah i Which, really want to know what you think about that well i mean that won't solve the problem i don't think um, partly because if you look at just preschool content, maybe you could make an argument for that. But what is kids' content? So if you make a video about elephants, say, or you make a video about, you know, anything, um, is that content designed – if a 10-year-old is watching that content because they want to learn about, you know, uh, how to build a robot or Lego builds or something, Lego builds, are they for grown-ups or are they for kids? So where do you draw the line on what is a video that the audience for that is designed to? For a child because if you take everything off YouTube that feasibly a child could be interested in watching which is what the ultimate objective is people want to make it so that kids don't want to go to YouTube they want to go to the YouTube kids as a platform um, which is a, a noble goal because there are problems around kids watching on YouTube main um, but that isn't solved by creating uh, an environment where you can manage to sequester all of that stuff. For, so, for people who don't understand, why would that? What what would that solve? Going to the kids, like what would yeah. the difference be? So the kids app is copper compliant. So there is a, a piece of legislation in the states, um, the Child's Online Privacy Protection Act, which is the FTC in America is currently. There's a, a group, some advocacy groups who have brought a complaint against YouTube and Google for breaching that, um, which basically says that you can't track any data for, for a child under the age of 13 and you can't, um, you know, advertise to them without parental consent and these kinds of things. So parents need to have opted into knowing that their child is going to use a service and there is no step for that on YouTube main. There are, there are steps for that over on YouTube Kids. So if you create... If you download the YouTube Kids app and you, um, the first time you log into that as a parent, you're led through an onboarding process that tells you, you know, with regards to what kind of data will be tracked and there's very little um, o tracked over in the YouTube Kids app and what permissions you need to, to give YouTube for them to be providing this service to your child who is under the age of 13. And where does a kid stop being a kid? What's that age level where they're like, you know, they 13. got... 13. So under, uh, the, under that... Um, particular legislation but right. that's only in america right yeah. so we have different rules in australia there are different rules in the uk so <laughs> everywhere around the world like in australia you can't advertise to a child and imply a benefit right we have this really funny little rule in in you know which when you're doing a brand deal of these things you have to think about the laws are different everywhere <laughs> if you're advertising to a child and you say you will be more cool on the playground if you have this product that's not allowed you right. just have to say this product exists you can't Correct. have fun then. You can't say that you're going to have fun with this product. That's Correct. a benefit. Yeah. You can't – yeah, you can't – Wow. You, so, you know, the, and that's just a one really specific area of the rules around yeah. advertising targeting children that's in Australia, let alone every country in the world. And YouTube is a global platform, right? Mm. So they are trying to solve advertising, you know, and tracking data for children in mm. all – areas of the world, like just look at GDPR in, in the EU and, you know, they also have to abide by all of that. So it's it's a really tough, tough situation for YouTube um, to to try and work within that. They, you know, and the, the people at YouTube that I've worked with, they all have really great intention and passion around solving this problem. They mm. all want to make sure mm. that YouTube 
is a safe, great place for kids to be watching. Um, so everyone are, everyone working on it is energised to make sure that that happens. Yeah. Um, but it's just a, it's a really difficult problem to solve. And at the moment, some of the suggestions around like, let's just put all kids viewing on the YouTube Kids app, like tell a nine-year-old not to op- open the YouTube main app and yeah. see how that goes, <laughs> you know. <laughs> well, probably most of your audience, according to analytics, are like, Late 20s. 35. 35. 35-year-old you know, yeah. dads. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Like yeah. you got just a whole bunch of 35-year-old guys. Uh, yeah. yeah. So the, because parents on on YouTube kids, there's no tracking. So we don't we don't get demographic data about the viewers over there. And on YouTube main, um, the it's for the person who's logged in. So if someone has a YouTube account and is logged into YouTube main and then hands that off to their child. YouTube doesn't know that the dad now isn't yeah. watching, that, that, that the child is now watching, um, which creates problems in itself, right? Because we, you know, we had um, a viewer tell us the other day that they got a pre-roll ad for Chucky, the movie trailer, and someone else said they got John Wick 2 Ooh. or 3 or whatever <laughs> we're up to, um, the movie trailer for that, which terrified their toddler, right? Mm. And that's a, that's a bad problem. I don't want that to be happening. And no one does... No one in the chain wants that to be happening. The parents don't want their kids to see inappropriate pre-rolls. Mm. Um, YouTube doesn't want kids to see inappropriate pre-rolls, but YouTube's not allowed to know that a child is watching and they're not allowed to target the advertisement mm. as though a child is watching because that's against the rules. So they have to respond to the person who is logged into the account and they have to assume that the dad who is currently logged in and who five minutes ago was watching a video about how to build a shed, <laughs> you know, but is now watching nursery rhymes, they're yeah. not allowed to make a connection that we jumped even though this is the same person on the same device. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Just just for the viewers or, or listeners who don't know, the algorithm basically follows the viewers. So, like, this is the issue. So if you're a dad and you're logged in and you're watching, like, garden shed videos or yes. action video, movie videos, kung fu videos, it's going gonna, it's gonna to give you more of that content, Exactly. Right? And then if your kid uses it, it's going to be using a different set of content like yeah, it doesn't content, know it that doesn't, now yeah. all of a sudden the person who's exactly. watching this next video is not the dad. Like yeah. a second ago you were watching an action movie and so let's show you a trailer for an action movie. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, there are some ways that YouTube can try and solve that problem but they're also trying to do that in a way that doesn't get on the wrong side of what regulators want them to do. Yeah. And regulators don't want them to know that a child is watching and show an ad for Barbie mm. as a pre-roll. Um, they, you know, so the regulators are kind of saying, no, show the John Wick trailer there mm. uh which no but nobody wins in that mm. scenario yeah uh, it's funny. I've, I've, it's like i use all these different systems now and my child listens like you know on spotify <laughs> or on netflix or anything like that and i'm like i keep getting these strange suggestions now because of all the different stuff the kid what my yes kid watches. Yeah. so we've had to create little accounts that we log into when yes. we're showing her content just so that we don't get these odd yeah, things and she doesn't yeah. get the odd things too. And, you know, like that is that might be one of the solutions, yeah. I think, in, in YouTube main to have a drop down where you can switch yeah. between something that you've created for your yeah. child and yeah. then that, that login has gone through the copper checks. Yeah. So you say, hey, I just want to create a child account in the YouTube main app. Yeah. Um, but for YouTube, it's it's easier if that's over in the YouTube Kids yeah. app. But yeah. it's it's really impossible to tell kids, hey, you're not allowed to open YouTube main, even though it's on dad's phone. Yeah. And I know you know how to pick up his phone and find the app, even yeah. though you're one, because yeah. they are so good at using smartphones. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, but, you know, we have to tell them that they have to open the the other app because that's the app that's for them. That's oh. just not it's just not practical. It's hard enough to get the parent to do that. I'm I'm just I'm going to open YouTube. Like yes. I'm a dad. I'm just like yeah, whatever. Yeah, here you go. Like, like it's <laughs> much more convenient, and that's the thing that they're fighting against, right? Like I think you know we like to think oh we could solve this by having a dedicated place for kids, but that already exists and parents don't use it. Like the majority of our watch time is on YouTube Main. Um, because people are, you know, streaming it to their tellies um, or they're they're out and about and so they're on their phone and they're in a rush and they and they want to give something to their child so that, you know, they can deal with this whatever other thing they're, they're working on. Um, for five minutes they need um, some distraction or something like that and the easiest thing in that scenario to do is open YouTube main. Taking away all kids' content from there won't change the fact that that is the more convenient way. So how would they then police telling people, you know, not to upload any content there that could arguably mm. be targeting a child? Tricky, 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 tricky. Yeah. Now, you did talk before about um, brand deals and monetization. Mm-hmm. It's an area that 
whenever we talk about kids content, one of the first questions we get is like, oh, wow, isn't there a lot of money in that? And you can earn a lot because the biggest creators in the world or who yeah. typically earn a lot of money are kids creators. Kids creators, yeah. Um, can you just tell us about the, the monetization models around kids Yeah, content? well, there's different ways that you can monetize kids content. The beauty of kids content is that AdSense can be a useful revenue model. Mm. Um, the kinds of numbers that you can get on some kids content, um, you know, we do – to 200 to 250 million views a month. Um, when you're talking AdSense on 200 million views a month, that's a decent revenue model. Even though the CPM, to be clear, <laughs> in yeah. kids' content is very low. Yeah, the so lowest I've ever come across. <laughs> again, just for the listeners here, that um, the issue typically with YouTube revenue is you need a lot of views in order yes. for the ad system, AdSense, to, to make you money. Yes. But with kids, you get these enormous amounts of views, so it actually can be worthwhile. Yeah, so the, the economics there make yeah. sense, like the equation can make sense. You yeah. need a certain amount of views before AdSense is uh, a useful model in terms of in terms of revenue. Mm. Um, but, yeah, with kids' content, you, you can get those views. But it's worth noting that the YouTube Kids app is not monetized mm. um, or – I should say the functionality exists for there to be advertising in the YouTube Kids app. So pre-rolls can be bought there, but advertisers are not buying them. Mm. Advertisers are more interested in buying them in the auction over in YouTube Main because mm. everyone prefers using, using YouTube Main. Yeah. So um, basically there's no revenue coming from the Kids app, um, which is another thing that would that would be difficult for YouTube um, in terms of they'd take away their incentives for all of their kids' creators if they moved all of content all content over to there because they don't have a really good um, advertising revenue model for that yet. But there are a lot of other ways that that um, kids um, kids brands can um, make revenue too. So if you've got a toy channel, for instance, um, affiliate linking is is still a big thing. If you're if you're um, advertising a product and then you can link through to that on on Amazon. Um, but there's also if you do music like we do, live shows, there's a lot of um, kids brands that are doing um, live shows, live touring. There's licensing so of videos to other platforms. Um, people will buy videos when it's a kid's video because unlike adult content, as I said before, they like to re-watch it, right? So if I need my video to watch that kid every day because they love it and then we're going on a plane, I need to buy that video to download. So, um, you know, there, there's a market there for that. Um, there's apps as well. A lot of kids' brands have have designed apps around their content. Um, there's licensing the IP, which is the traditional kids' media model. So um, most broadcast kids' IPs, the model there is you make a show. You know, I'm talking, you know, Thomas the Tank Engine, Peppa Pig, whatever it happens to be. Um, you make the show and the, and the broadcaster will give you a relatively small amount to put it on their station. But then the way that you um, make revenue from that audience is through licensing and, and merch. So then it, the, your character, Peppa Pig, appears on a T-shirt in Target um, and that's where the, the revenue is generated. It's not actually generated from the content itself. It's from the licensing of the IP for merch. Um, that hasn't translated quite as well over into digital online brands yet, partly because the licensing industry is such a high-risk industry. If you, you know, there's only going to be 10 shirts on the shelf at Target for kids and so if you're the buyer and you have to pick the 10 IPs that are going to go on those shirt, are you going to choose Frozen or are you going to choose Cocomelon, which <laughs> is, you know, the biggest kids brand on YouTube? And you might choose Cocomelon these days, but mm. previously you would always choose Frozen. Mm. And I guess for some uh, someone who's looking to get into kids content, um, you should do it because you love, you know, yeah. <laughs> creating the content. But, you know, in terms of the revenue model... Um, you, you can't sustainably make kids' content if you don't love it. Yeah. Like, you, you're you going to be working on stuff that will drive you crazy. Yeah. Like, but, like, very, it's very nature. If you enjoy the content, you yeah. probably haven't made it very well for kids. Because, yeah. <laughs> you know, like, I, not... I mean, I, I love the content that we work on, but, you know, one of the things we say around our office is if we dig the song too much, it's yeah. it's not going to be a hit, yeah. you know, because we reproduce a lot of different songs and the ones that are repetitive and inane and drive us a little bit crazy, those are the ones that the kids love. And the ones that we're singing around the office like, yeah, really dig this song, we're like, mm, it's probably a bit too complicated then, isn't it? So, yeah. you know, there is a difference in when you're creating for an adult content, you're making something that you personally are going to love. But if you're creating something for a three-year-old and you love it, you you haven't met your audience where they are. Mm. Interesting. How do, how do you get to that point? Like um, a lot of trial and error? You, you know. Yeah, a lot of trial and error. And like having a lot of kids in your life that you'll 
focus group with, you know. Um, a good example of that, our baby shark video, which is our most popular video, um, that I was working on that for about four or five months, I think, and then I got a final edit of the video, showed it to some kids in my life, and it's a very repetitive song um, for anyone who hasn't heard Baby Shark before. I'm, I'm sorry if you go and look that up because now it'll yeah. be stuck in your head for the next week. Yeah. Um, next week? <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I'm doing do, yeah. it right now. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so that video I'd been working on for months and months and I showed it to my niece and because it's a very repetitive song and our, the way we did that nursery rhyme, we structured it with – um, the main refrain, an original verse, and then two repeats of the main refrain, an original verse. So the two repeats later on are content that's already existed. And I showed her the, the, the cut of the video that I had done and she got up to the third repeat and she looked at me and she said, is it all the same? And she gave me back the phone. Wow. Now, children don't give back the phone unless <laughs> they're really bored, right? Mm. So, you know, I went away, I said, okay, the fourth, the, the third verse, as it was there, it needs to be completely re-edited. So we added another month to the editing time, we added animations, we changed what that looked like in the edit at that point, um, showed it to my niece again and she, she got all the way to the end and she said, can we watch it again? And I was like, mm. okay, now the video is ready. Can we just talk about Baby Shark for a second, being a, an a enormous phenomenon. <laughs> it is a phenomenon, yeah. 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 Well, well, where, like the genesis of it. I mean, yeah. yeah, like where did this all come from? So it's a nursery rhyme from from the States mainly. It was a camp song for years and years, but it had a li- it was a little bit darker in the way that scouts would do it. Like you'd get kind of eaten by the shark and then, right. you know, you'd have to do CPR and things like that. And everyone kind of had a slightly different version. <laughs> <laughs> of how more of the would, Jaws version. Yeah, of more shark. of the Jaws version. Um, and then a few years ago, Pink Fong um, made their version of it yeah. and it just became – it just – was such a success like they they you know their version is real bop and it's um (laughs) it's it's a really great jam and so the song became hugely popular but it's also those hand actions are so easy for kids to do and it's so repetitive it has all of the ingredients that makes for a really great children's video on youtube um and so their video just took off and um so a lot of other creators were making versions of the nursery rhyme as well um but because of the success of the pink fong version it turned into a mega trend on on youtube as things can do it is it's funny because it's it's so upbeat but it's a little bit dark when you know let's go hunt do 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 yeah so we don't do that i know yeah you don't do that yeah run away yeah, right no, away. Run away or swim away? Swim yeah. away. Yeah. So those are some of the ones that are from the scout chant. You yeah, know, that, yeah, yeah. That's some of the darker well, stuff that, that, that was makes in the more sense version. now. Where, okay, okay, I understand it. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So because there's been a, an evolution of that nursery yeah, rhyme, yeah. those lyrics are sort of from that original yeah. thing. And we just sort of took that out and, and made it, you know, super uber kid friendly. And yeah. we're like, let's go find an octopus. And yeah. <laughs> 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 like, let's be friends with the crab. Right. Okay, interesting. So now that's where it all came from. So now we know who to blame the scouts. Yeah, <laughs> the scouts. But also Pink Fong. I mean, their version Pink, turned yeah, it totally. into a turned it because there were there were lots of versions on YouTube before theirs, yeah. and it wasn't the phenomenon that it was. Yeah. But then their video was so successful, it just it, completely. It's funny because we've talked to the guys from Pink Fong, and they're yeah. very humble about it. They were like, "Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a good song." They're like, "Yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's an enormous <laughs> it's like, set the world yeah, on fire." Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I remember amazing. when we, when we, we met Ryan from Pink Fong, and I I actually only maybe two weeks before had seen Baby Shark and met him and I was just kind of like, I, I'm i impressed but I kind of hate you right now because I can't <laughs> stop <laughs> thinking about it. And I was telling people like a, about this, like I'm like, oh, you know, this Pink Fong and then, the, you know, like what they're doing and, and this immense channel, like they've grown huge. And I'm like, yeah. but I don't really want to tell you what the – video is because if you look it up you'll hate me yes like, you know, that's adults. why i'm apo- that's why i'm apologizing to all of the yeah. listeners because now you're going to be curious and you're going to go watch it and yeah that's going to be stuck yeah, in your head. yeah. show it to your kids yeah love show, it. They, they will look. oh you could show them bounce patrols version yeah. that would be yeah great yeah too. Definitely. <laughs> you, you actually have a really you do have a very good version of it oh thank you yeah so it, it is definitely worth checking out i'm gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> i mean as as a baby shark song so. I, <laughs> do, <laughs> if you want to look up a, a jaws version of that <laughs> like the flaunt <laughs> the like adult version, you yeah, know, yeah, like yeah. The, yeah you know but you know what would i mean for anyone out there who wants to take it up like what would an adult version of baby shark look like oh yeah i mean and there's there's plenty of those on youtube but you know what'll happen they'll create it the algorithm will go crazy and like no 
oh, inappropriate, and then all yeah, the paper sharks yeah. are <laughs> 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 That's another technical uh, challenge for YouTube to deal with the inappropriate yeah. versions of baby, baby shark. It'll be the baby shark demonetization. And if you can bring <laughs> it, if, and if it can be traced back to creator generation, that could be an awesome <laughs> thing. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like the like the whole, uh, was it the Vox demonetization? So yeah. the Vox really helped. But, you know, anyway, going yeah. off topic on that. But hey, if we could, baby shark would be a bigger phenomenon. If we could. If we could shut that. I'd prefer you didn't shut yeah, down no, the monetization no, no. on Baby Shark no, just, no, just, no, just no. for my but business. I think we should just highlight it and, and <laughs> get more people watching it and <laughs> that'd be better. Do you, I mean, obviously Baby Shark was a, is, a, is a phenomenon. Um, yeah. What goes, I know it's hard to say, like hard to make a very video viral, but what goes into a really successful kids song yeah. video? Mm. I, I mean, there's a there's a lot of ingredients that will add up to that. Again, it's going to be different in preschool versus other kids' content. So it really depends on the age bracket that you're targeting. Um, but if you're targeting preschool specifically, um, there's there's lots of things that go into that. So the repetitiveness of the song, them being able to um, understand how the song works by the end of the video, hooking them early, um, making sure that, they're, that the first, you know, 10 seconds of the video are something that they can get excited about. Um, making sure it's bright and colourful um, and that the people are engaging th- with them in a way that, you know, kids can appreciate, um, making big faces and all of that kind of thing, doing thumbnail face but in the video. Mm. Um, yeah. I, you say you I mean, you also write the songs, right? I like, don't write the songs. I work with a bunch of very talented songwriters well, who, who write the songs. Well, in, in terms of developing the songs. Yeah, right? de- I yeah, work with developing the songs. What, like... You said, like, if you sing it around the office and it sounds floppy, then you'll say, no, the kids won't like that. Yeah. Um, and it's true. The, the songs I typically dislike the most from kids' songs yes. are the ones <laughs> I get stuck in my head, but they're, yes. just, they're just there. And I think I know if I dislike it that much, it's probably going to be re- – it's a successful thing for kids. Yeah, yeah. Is that, like, your test? It's like, <laughs> if it gets stuck in your head and you don't like it, then that's what works. Yeah, partly. I mean, to be clear, we don't dislike <laughs> any of our songs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's more like the ones that are our favourites we yeah. worry about. And right. then the ones that we're like, yeah, if I have to listen to this one more time. But, you know, you like it the first 2,000 times. It's maybe yeah. like on the 6,000th listen for us that we're, you know, um, because we, we listen to them a lot. But, yeah, uh, those elements of something that's nice and simple, that's not too complicated, even musically, like for us because we're a music channel. So if you look at the instrumentation for something, if you have a lot going on with the rhythm section and, you know, what the bass is doing and then there's like 10 different instruments going in there all doing different things and there's a, a real breadth to the sound in the instrumentation track, that's the kind of thing that might just end up being a bit sonically overwhelming. Mm. Um, so, you know, we will, we will sometimes pare that back and make our instrumentations um, simpler um, and make sure that there's, you know, bars of rest in between spoken parts. So it's just kind of like there was a musical idea. Pause. Okay, here's another musical idea, you know, because we just can't keep on top of like that chorus and then there was the drop and then there was the whatever. So mm. just even in some of the like structural things, you just design it around the the way that a child consumes something and pay attention to the way a child consumes something, right? Like if it gets a little bit overwhelming and there's a lot going on, kind of assault of a senses, then mm. that's, you know, something they might turn off. But if, if it's something that they can kind of follow along with and understand and then, you know, like we're on the fourth repeat of this chorus and they're like, yeah, this is the part where they tell me to turn around. So now I'm going to turn around because I know what's about to happen because I've, I've understood this from the first three repeats of the chorus. Mm. So you guys have been doing this about seven years, right? Yes, yeah. Um, have you got like a, a, a bumper formula down pat? Uh, if I had a formula down pat, every one of my videos would be, you know, an 800 million view video and only a couple of them are. So I would say no, but I I'm guess pretty I'm good at... Stop you for a second. You have some videos <laughs> that are 800 million views. Well, you remember yeah, the, <laughs> that is like, I don't think there are many creators who have... Any video, <laughs> with eight hundred million. Our baby views. shark video that's has over eight hundred million views. Eight hundred million and views. I, yeah, that's a that's a big number. Mm. It, yeah, it's this is baby shark, man. It's yeah. a phenomenon. <laughs> it is a phenomenon. Yeah. And our second most watched video is our Halloween version of baby shark, which has about oh. six hundred million or something like wow. that. Yeah, there you go. Pumpkins. Sorry, I carried yeah. carry so, uh, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, the original songs. If I had a if I had a, a formula for it, um, 
then I would only make hits. I think every creator, if they knew exactly what was going to be the most successful video, they would just make that over and over, right? And mm. But we all like experiment with different things and, and what works in any given season isn't necessarily going to be what works in the next season. So just like with all content on YouTube, some things are popular for six months and then people get a little bit sick of that and then the, the, the next thing is, is popular. Um, and that can be related to changes to the recommendation algorithm so if it's about video length and and things of that nature or it can be about um, things to do with audience trends so if the audience was was really into videos about you know trucks for a while but but now they're sick of it the, luckily enough with kids trends it tends to be i mean because they age out of it right and mm. now there's a whole bunch of new two-year-olds who were one last year but now they're the two-year-olds who are interested in trucks <laughs> and there's a few topics there that kids are always interested in so mm. dinosaurs trucks unicorns you know there's a few things there that just are are always going to be um every kid loves them so uh, those don't change so much, but a lot of the things to do with what YouTube is leaning into with their recommendation algorithm changes according to um, what YouTube is currently uh, seeing as the the best way to grow their audience. Do you have any videos that tank? Anymore? Oh yeah, I like, mean, and what is it? Tank? And what to tank to you? Yeah, uh, that's, uh, I'm going to make people hate me when I say that. It's but all proportional, yeah. like, like you know. Yeah, you know, like I mean, under. 15, 20 million views would be a tank for us. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and, they, and you still get them though? Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know, it's what is this junk? <laughs> 20 million views. <laughs> I think, I mean, and the other thing is kids content though, right? It's, that it's not about, whereas if you're making a content for a grown up, you could say within a month of the video's release, whether it tanked or not, mm. but kids content is completely evergreen. So like some of our most popular videos are the ones that we made five years ago and all of our videos just slowly get all their views over time. They don't get a big rush of views mm. right at the start. And then you know whether it was a, a hit or not. And some videos that were not a hit for the first two years of their life might then start getting recommended by the algorithm. So mm. um, it, it's, we do get flops, absolutely. I and mean, I've had a lot of flops in the last six months, actually. Um, 20 million view flops. <laughs> yeah. uh, yeah. That's bigger than some movies. Like, oh, this, is, this is garbage. Um, yeah, but they, they put, they, you know, when you're comparing to 800 million views, then yeah. 20 seems like, you know. Nothing, yeah. It seems like nothing. Yeah. But, you know, our nursery rhymes always do better than our originals, but we will keep doing originals because we do those for, for our souls. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, you know, where a child is going to really love us doing Mary Had a Little Lamb or, you know, the wheels on the bus. And then we want to do an original song about learning colours or learning counting or, you know, learning to count in four different languages. Those are the ones that we feel really good about making. And so we kind of do like one for you, two for us, one for you, two for us. So we're going to keep making those ones that we really love because parents really love those ones as well, right? Like the gateway video that brings the child in is going to be the nursery rhyme. But then the ones where parents are going to feel good about your brand, your channel, children, like leaning into your channel as a as an experience um they're the ones that we like making as well so a parent is going to really appreciate a video about learning to count in four different languages mm. um and a child is really going to like the wheels on the bus right but mm. so we're going to make both and we're going to please the parents at the same time um and please ourselves that's very cool it's a very sophisticated way of looking at it too really like it's yeah well because we have a dual audience right so we are serving the kids but we're ultimately serving the parents mm. because if the parents don't trust our brand and if the parents don't like what we're making because a lot of a lot of kids content is co-watched you know so they'll put it on they'll stream it to the telly um and so the parents are around and they can hear it in the background oh yes we yeah. can <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, you know, if the parents don't like our content, then they're not going to let the kids watch it. So we need to please the parents first um, and we need to, to um, really make sure that, that they trust what we're doing. They trust that they could put our channel on and just um, autoplay everything from our channel and everything in there would be completely wholesome and appropriate for their children um, and nutritious as well. And so if we can achieve that and make sure that parents can see that and understand that from us, then that's ultimately going to help us grow long term. It might not help us in the immediate short term in terms of getting views in the same way that doing you know, a video that the algorithm is specifically going to love will do. But we do that as well. So we just make, make sure we have a, a healthy balance. And we have enough gateway videos that will bring people to the channel, but then we have a solid library that will keep people on the channel and keep parents um, enjoying what we do. Speaking, speaking of library, how many videos have you guys made over the years, approximately? Ah, uh, I don't know, like a hundred or 
uh, between 100 and 150, probably something like that. Oh. I don't know off the top of my head. Yeah, a big number. And, how, and I would I would have thought that was a small number in seven mm. years. So what's, it's your, what's your frequency mix. then? How many do you put out in a year? Um, last year we did 13 original music videos. The yeah. year before it was 16. Um, so you know we generally try for one a month or more if we can do that. But we will not put out a video until we think it's ready mm. because. For us in preschool content, we're trying to make a video that will be rewatchable every day for a year. So it's not about the frequency of the video. It's about the the quality of the video and, and how well that's going to resonate with kids. So we'll spend the time on it that it needs. So we, you know, it takes us three to four months to, to work on one video. Um, they usually roll off the end of the production line about one a month, but each video is is going through um, the production process for about four months. And, that, and that's why I said a big number because one, well, it's a big number of the back catalogue, but also it is original yes. content that you're creating. Yeah. And um, just hearing you talk about, you know, adding an extra month to um, yeah. to the edit of just one video that had already had a number of months yes, of work that, into it. And, and that's why it was so disappointing at that stage. It's like, oh, it's not ready. I really thought it was ready, but, you know, it's, <laughs> it's not because you, you want it to be ready at that stage, but it's worth it. I wouldn't do that with everything, but I knew that – I, we worked really hard on our baby shark video because it was already a phenomenon at that point, right? So we sat down and we said, okay, if we do baby shark well, it could be, you know, a really big video for us. And I didn't think it was going to be an 800 million view video, but I was like, you know, I'd like to get to 300 million, um, which was our biggest video at the time. And so our approach to that was very much, if we do this well, it can completely take off. So we were particularly careful about that one and thought really hard at every step of the process about how to ap- actually maximize the potential that that had because it was the kind of thing that could take off. So we spend a lot of time and energy working on the ones that we think will be our gateway videos. So we have big hero videos that we know we'll spend twice as much time and energy on. And then we have other videos that are going to be kind of like catalog videos. And those ones we won't necessarily, you know, focus group as much or, you know, I might only do 10 thumbnail designs instead of 30, which is what I did for Baby Shark, for instance. My mind is still spinning on the numbers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, I've got to, I want to ask you something. And then I'm like, I'm just like, I can't because I'm just, I'm in. Mean, um, <laughs> 800 million. Yeah. It's well, a at the number, moment we do about seven or eight million views a day. So it's just, it's, that is, that's, uh, that's not, a, not a bad number. It's super yeah. cool. Um, please don't hate Shannon. Like yeah, please don't. It's, it's we started very slow, and it took us a long. It took yeah, us a, they, they a were, slow burn. To it was get a slow here. start at three, four hundred thousand a day, <laughs> yeah. you know? and and that was hard. They were hard days. <laughs> hard days. I, I, we, had, you know, in our first year, we were doing you know less than a thousand a day. Well, Everyone starts from zero. Everyone starts from zero. Yeah, and I, I kind of wanted to just just circle back to that. What was the start like for you? Like you know, like when you. You you and you know you got your mates together and we're like hey let's, let's make some kids <laughs> content from a, a maths YouTuber tutor <laughs> yeah and business trust woman. me I want to film you and put you on the internet dancing silly in tutus it'll be great <laughs> now like after hearing all these numbers hell yeah I'm in yeah, you know, yeah where's the tutu I'm joining up <laughs> bounce control but yeah. um like yeah what was that like like what what, what well what was that? my friends had a lot of trust in me because at that point I'd ask them to do lots of silly creative projects I'm one of those people who you know had been putting together you know like hey I'm doing a recording for I'm starting a choir and we're making a CD so turn up on Thursday rehearsals at five. You know, that kind of thing. Um, I didn't even give Jackson, who's, who's one of the cast members, a choice. I just, I've got the text message I sent him. I said, I'm starting a kids' band rehearsals on Thursday. I'll see you there. <laughs> you know, I was just like, this is where you're required to be. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> yes, so they, they had a lot of trust in me at that point because, uh, yeah, we'd done a lot of, a lot of different projects together, um, a lot of musical theatre, that kind of thing. So um, they, they, they didn't know much about YouTube at the time because – you know, it wasn't as big as then as it is now. Um, but uh, because I had an established YouTube channel as well, I said, "Look, I I work. I think I've worked this out. I I I really enjoy YouTube and and working on YouTube, and I think I know how to make a successful channel. And you know, you guys love to dance and sing, and I don't want to direct another musical because I somehow thought this would be less work, which is hilarious. Because. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, as we all know, YouTube is all-consuming and it is the most work of all of the things. <laughs> um, yeah. Yep. <laughs> um, and then, so early on, like, what we did straight off the bat, you were making original 
yes. compositions and content. Yeah, original mm. songs straight straight out of the gate. So that was what we spent a, we spent about six to nine months in pre production before we launched the channel. So oh. um, in rehearsals and then also working with songwriters on um, producing the the first few songs that we were going to produce, and then figuring out how to make a video. So the videos that I had made on the maths channel were like screen capture of me writing you know, doing maths problems. So I'd never actually filmed anything. So, you know, I had to figure out how to shoot and how to edit and all of that sort of stuff. So that took me a few months to learn as well. Um, and then producing producing the, the first couple of videos, we had sort of three ready to go before we launched so that we would have um, a few within a couple of weeks of each other out the gate because the first few, you know, they took four months each, you know, to make. Um, and we wanted to have, we didn't want to have one video out and then wait four months and then have one video video out and then wait four months. So we sort of um, had pre-batched some stuff before we launched so that we could get the ball rolling. Yeah, right. So you 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 guys dived like heavily into this. It wasn't just like, let's give it a crack and make a funny video, like make a, um, a kid's video yeah. next week and no. <laughs> see how this goes. And it's like, it was many months of yeah, it was hard yakka before anything even got Yeah, correct. Published. Yeah, a lot of work in the in the in the lead up to it, um, and you know investment as well because it because it wasn't necessarily cheap to hire songwriters to write original songs and then audio engineers to mix the tracks and all of that kind of thing. So not knowing necessarily where it would go or whether it we would be successful, um, you know, I just had had some confidence going in that I wouldn't have had if I hadn't done the other channel previously. Mm-hmm. I think. And then how lo- how many videos through? Did you get to a point where you go, you know what, this is actually worth continuing yeah. the push? Yeah, I think it was – I think we were about two and a bit years in when we broke even. Wow. Um, so, yeah, it was probably about – I think it was about two years. Um, and then it was like, okay, we've paid back all of our initial investment. This is great. Now we are at zero. <laughs> and that, now we grow from here. Is that when you went full-time or were you full-time before? No, I it still wasn't full-time at that right. point. Yeah. So um, I went full-time – a couple of years ago now, so probably sort of four or five years in. Right. So I was working during the day and then doing Bounce Patrol at night and on the weekends. Which I think is incredibly important for people to hear because we're talking silly, big views. Yes. And success. But seven years down the track, two and a half years of yeah, being negative. In, yeah, <laughs> being in the <laughs> red. zero. Yeah. Work, you know, the, and the passion and the and the hard work. And yeah. And then, you know, mm. number of years later, like that's a um, – but if I wasn't enjoying it, I wouldn't have been able to do that as well. Like it's yeah, interesting right. you talk about the passion. Yeah. Like it was a great fun project with my friends on the weekend, you know, for the first couple of years. And like any hobby, it cost a bit of money to do. But, you know, you take up playing guitar, you got to buy a guitar. You take yeah. up, you know, archery, you're going to spend money on the lessons or whatever. So <laughs> like any hobby, I was just thinking of it as, you know, this is the thing that I like to do with my time, with my friends, and it costs a bit of money to do. And hopefully we can turn it into a business. But if we don't, we still had a great time along the way. But it was it was a hard yakka for, mm. for a long time there. It sounds like you had that belief too, like that. Yeah. I, you yeah. Know, I'm backing myself here. Like. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, I think that comes from – partly coming from a business background, but then, uh, you know, also just doing lots of different creative projects um, over the years, you know, like I, I'm, I just like to start things, you know, <laughs> like I started a, I started a fan club for a book series that I liked when I was 15 and, you know, it became the official fan club and the author of the series, you know, we just had a 10 year reunion recently. It was, it was fabulous, wow. but you know, it's just, I, I've always got harebrained schemes and different projects that I'm working on so that's actually a, a, a really interesting point because we talk to creators about it all the time like it's a hard slog and if you're not passionate you're gonna get but you're gonna burn out yeah you gotta love you what you do to, you have to love it yeah. and that's why and you know particularly in kids content like if, if you're not gonna really enjoy making kids content don't go into making kids content because you think there's going to be a payday like mm. you're going to be listening to baby shark on repeat for a year yeah. a year <laughs> um so <laughs> like you you have to you have to love that and you have to love the silliness of it and you have to love getting dressed up in a crazy tutu and you know <laughs> filming with your mates um so yeah. Yeah, the, without the passion behind it, when you have the challenges, which inevitably come up, and they certainly did for Bounce Patrol, when you have the bad days where it's like, oh, my gosh, panic stations, terrible stuff is happening, or, you know, we're getting these horrendous comments from people on the internet and those kind of things. If you don't love what you're doing, when the bad stuff happens, you won't have enough motivation to continue mm. um, because if, you, if you're if you at a neutral kind of base and then terrible stuff happens, then you get 
sunk low. Whereas if you're at a, this is super fun and I'm really passionate about this, when terrible stuff happens, it takes you to neutral. And then you're like, well, I can just keep doing this for a few weeks and I don't like it or, or you know, I don't like it, but I don't hate it and this is fine. Um, but if you start with just being neutral, then you'll, you'll end up in negative when that stuff happens. Early on, did you learn any hard lessons that people could benefit from hearing about? <laughs> yes. I would say get a lawyer to look over any contracts that you're going to sign early on. Um, and if you can't afford a lawyer, you probably can't afford to sign that contract. Yeah. Um, we, well, I mean, music licensing is notoriously complicated and complex. Um, and that's one of the areas where, you know, when you start on YouTube, you think I can do all of the things because you're doing the video editing and you're doing the filming and you're doing the script writing and you're doing the whatever. So you're like, I can just learn everything I need to learn. So, you know, I was like, I can learn how to write a, contract how i'm gonna be yeah don't do that <laughs> um so i yeah i think there are there are hard lessons to learn um but they'll be different for everybody so i think it's just about having good people behind you and and having a plan as well so having like a like a risk management kind of um uh approach um or or um chart that you can kind of work back towards so and this is you know coming from a business background i've got in my head like what are all the possible things that could go wrong with my channel so you know all of my cast could leave or the channel could be deleted or, you know, go through, make a list of all of the things that could possibly go wrong with your channel and just write down for yourself, like, if that happened, what would be step one, two and three? And, like, not all the way to step ten, but just, like, who would I call? What would I do in that situation so that when that happens, you know, when you're having a massive freak out because this terrible thing has gone wrong, you can be like, okay, I'm just going to get the piece of paper out of the drawer and I'm going to look at it and it's going to say, okay, step one, call this person, you know, and ask them for their advice. And, you know, because in those moments you don't necessarily know what am I going to do and, you, and you're panicking, you know. So if someone's hacked your channel, say, like have a plan for what you're going to do when someone hacks your channel. And it, through that process you will do a bit of risk management on like I'm going to turn on two-factor authentication and I'm going to do xyz and I'm going to have a contact email for someone at YouTube that I know I can still access outside of my Gmail account which is linked to my so if I can't get into my Gmail account I still have that contact written somewhere else that's not in that address book and you know those kind of things so that you just know like this is what I would do on that day just have like a couple of things worked out for what those catastrophes are because then when they happen you'll have a good plan for them that's great advice i've never heard that before for a, for a creator or a, actually i don't think for anybody I, it's, it's, i'm like thinking about oh yeah i probably need to write that list <laughs> i'll just start running around in circles um and then uh, I finally i just want to ask like if you had like one one piece of advice from all your years as a as a top kids creator and maybe even i didn't prep you on it specifically for other kids creators or you know or, or family content creators, if they had one piece of advice to give, what would that be? I think follow your audience. So particularly for kids creators, because you are not three or seven or however old your audience is, you need to really try and understand them to serve them well. So make sure that you're paying attention to what is going on in your vertical, um, what other creators are doing in your space who are having success and why you think they're having success. Um, but then also talk to kids about what they like on YouTube and why they like it um, and make sure that you're not creating for what you think kids are going to like. You're actually creating for what kids will actually like because that is to this day still different. I will think to myself like, oh, this would be a really great thing that a kid will like and then I'll go and ask a three-year-old about it and they will get bored in the conversation and wander off and I'm like, well, that turns out I was wrong. <laughs> That's great advice and a great place to wrap it up. Yep. Fred says yes. Shannon Jones from Bounce Patrol, thank you so much for joining us on Creator Generation. Thanks for having me. I am going to go get a tutu. I'm going <laughs> to join the crew and maybe we can start a spin-off channel and, yeah. you know, maybe start off at a – I'll go for the little 15 mil. Yeah, 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 we'll, just, yeah we'll just yeah. do a 15 mil video. Yeah, that's right. Awesome. Yeah, might, yeah thanks. <laughs> thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Bye. Bye. 
That is absolutely fascinating. It is amazing when you hear those numbers. <laughs> Insane. So if you love kids content, get involved. It's a growing area. And if you've never heard Baby Shark before, check out Bass Patrol's version. It is quite good and will never leave your brain. No run away. Do, do. <laughs> yeah. And on that note, we are off. We'll see you next week. See you next week. Bye. Bye. Bye.